All right. So hello, everyone, and welcome to RBCM at Home Summer. Orcas, orcas everywhere. Orcas, orcas are everywhere. And um, they are on your screen right now as we're um, doing this program. And today we're doing, uh, tonight we're doing a special program with um, a great partner organization, Nature Kids BC. And we're really, we're really pleased to be able to, to share this evening with Nature Kids BC and all the, the kids out there. So um, just to let you know that if you haven't been to the Royal BC Museum before, uh, the museum is located on the, uh, the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. Uh, here in Victoria. And I am an, un an uninvited guest on this territory and I'm grateful to live, learn and raise a family on this land. It's um, a, in, in a joy and also a responsibility uh, that I take really seriously to continually educate myself um, and try to further um, knowledge for our team and our and our museum here on connecting with the land and the territory. So um, I really, because everyone is joining from all over BC and beyond, just ask you to give us give a moment just to think about what territory you're you're on and also how you how you find connections with the, the land and the, the history of that territory. So if you haven't been to the museum before, there it is. This is the picture of the front of the museum as the sun is going down. Um, to the left is the galleries uh, building. And then to the right is the collections building uh, with most of the objects, specimens, belongings, documents. And in front of that building is the BC archives. So my question for you, if you're on chat, if you're on Zoom or on Facebook Live, um, even if you're a panelist, uh, <laughs> my question for you for a day, you don't have to commit for your lifetime, but for a day, would you rather be an orca, a sea lion, or a sea otter? So lots of advantages to all three of those. You could only pick one. Do you wanna be small and cute like a sea otter? You want to spend most of your time on your back. You want to have little arms that you can like cradle a, a sea urchin and munch on. Um, do you want to be big and uh, be somewhat in the water and somewhat out of the water, have a really loud voice like a sea lion? Or do you want to be an orca? Do you want to be in a pod? Do you want to be in the water most of the time, going through the water? So. I'm seeing um, orcas, I'm seeing sea otters, lots of otters and lots of orcas. Megan and Rebecca, do you have a, you, what are you gonna be for say tomorrow? Sea otter has so much fun. Yeah, <laughs> you're not alone. You will, you will be in a pack of other sea otters <laughs> or I guess a float, I think it's called a float. Uh, I'll Megan, be with orca, an orca for the day. Okay, great. Yeah. How about you, Kim and Dakota? Dakota and I both want to be orcas for the day. OK, great. Well, you've come to the right place, because this is a program about orcas. But we welcome sea otters and sea lions. If you happen to be a sea otter and a sea lion, you're welcome to come, too. So um, and of course, like I said, today's program is in partnership with Nature Kids BC. Um, so what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we could see uh, the faces larger. <laughs> um, and um, like I said, I, I am really joy uh, pleased to be joined by Rebecca Clapperton Law and Megan Tresher um, from Nature Kids BC. So before we begin our tour of the Orcas exhibition, Rebecca and Megan, would you like to say a few words about uh, Nature Kids BC? Especially for those who are joining in that uh, might not know about Nature Kids BC. Definitely, we're so happy to be here. Thanks, Chris. And uh, hello everyone to the virtual Explorer Day here all about orcas. 
Today could not have happened without the imagination and leadership of our team member, Megan, who's zooming in from Eastern Standard Time in Ottawa. So we're super grateful that she spent the entire summer with us as one of our team members. We're really happy that you can join us, that um, the team at the Royal BC Museum has opened up their virtual doors for us to travel to the gallery. We saw the picture of the gallery in Victoria from all of the corners of the province. And in fact, I can see folks zooming in from other places outside of BC. So very special, great big thanks to Chris and Kim and Dakota and the rest of the team behind the scenes that are inviting nature kids and friends into the gallery for the evening. So I'm Rebecca and I'm from Nature Kids and I'm zooming in today from my home in traditional and unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam and tsleil peoples and nations. And we really are so very grateful to these nations who have cared for the lands and the water since time immemorial. So if, if you are zooming in as a new friend to Nature Kids BC, we are a nature discovery and environmental action organization that's been for over 21 years helping children and families get outside to their nearby nature to play and to explore, to learn about and to take action for nature. So we usually do this with in-person events uh, through our community and our club events all over the province. There are 25 different community groups that are networked into Nature Kids. And during the last year or so, when we weren't able to meet in person, we've also been offering these virtual events, but only through the gift of time and mentoring with partners like the Royal BC Museum with Chris and Kim and Dakota. Again, just so grateful. So uh, orcas are meaningful species inside our ecosystem in the province and we just can't wait to learn more. Thanks Chris for the opportunity to bring our community together to be with you today. Great, thanks again for, Megan, did you wanna say a couple words or? Um, no, I'm good. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for staying up late to, to join in with us. But there is someone from Brooklyn, so you're not you're not alone in your, your time zone. So wow, okay. That's nice to know. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> and uh, and also there's uh, someone joining in from near the Canadian border in New York State. So um, we have the Eastern time zone uh, covered pretty well. Um so I'm going to, um, before we begin our tour, I actually have, I actually have a poll because um, I have a couple questions just to get our minds going on, um, on orcas. So I'm going to, I'm going to launch the poll. If you're on Zoom, you can answer. If you're on Facebook Live, you could just answer by using the comment section. Okay, so I'm launching the, the poll. And the first question is, can, can everyone see that? So let's get technical. Orcas are mammals, fish, or a rare form of duck. So if you're on Zoom, and even if you're, if you're, um, if you are a panelist, you can, you can uh, put your, your, your guess as well. So right on, right in the poll, you can put your guess. Number two, the question is, orcas get around, or orcas get around. You can find them in which oceans? The Pacific Ocean and o an Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean and Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean and Arctic Ocean, or all of the oceans? And the last question is, Sound, sounding like a scientist. So the scientific name for orca is Orchinus orca. And this roughly translates to fish feaster, whales of the wave, demons of the deep, or beasts of the bay. All right. So that's, so those are the questions to get your mind going around orcas. I'll just give that a couple more minutes to see. Um, it looks like the first one 
people kind of uh, got it, but not not everyone. There's a little bit of debate. Um, so I'm gonna give it just maybe five more seconds. Three, two, one, thank you, Kim. And then we're ending the poll and I'm gonna share the results. Okay, so let's get technical. Orcas are, 90% of you thought mammals and that's true. Orcas are mammals. Question number two, orcas get around. You can find them in which ocean? So some of you thought just the Pacific Ocean and Atlantic Ocean, some the Pacific Ocean and Indian Ocean, some the Pacific Ocean and Arctic Ocean, but the, the answer is all of the oceans. And that's the, the amazing thing about orcas is that they, they really do, they do get around. Um, but they're probably studied most closely um, here in this, in this part of the world. So, and then lastly, sounding like a scientist. So the scientific name for orca is Orchinus orca. This roughly translates to, uh, here we get like a little bit of a, like more evenly an answered. So fish feaster, whales of the wave, demons of the deep or beasts of the bay. So I have a 16 year old kid and uh, named Asa and Asa helped me with this. So Asa came up with fish feaster, whales of the wave and beasts of the bay. Um, Asa did not come up with demons of the deep because demons of the deep is the right answer. It's roughly translate to, translates to demons of the deep. All right, so now, um, so now we're gonna, because we're, we have this new exhibition um, and this new exhibition that's been open for a few months now, but um, it's, still, it's still new to us. So uh, it's Orcas, Our Shared Future. And what we wanna do is spend some of the time um, that we have here this hour in the, in the gallery, in the exhibition, and some of it behind the scenes. Remember the first image that I showed there was a galleries building and there was a collections building. So today, tonight, we're gonna go in both the galleries building and the collections building, which is very special. Um, but we're gonna start in the collections building and we're gonna start with my colleagues, Kim and Dakota. Um, so I am going to spotlight your video, Kim and Dakota, and you are hey. on. Well, thanks, thanks, Chris. Welcome everybody. We are on the second floor of the Royal BC Museum. That's where we have our feature exhibition, Orcas our shared future. And I wanna start this exhibit by sharing a welcome from Florence Dick. Florence is a member of the Songhees First Nations and she's gonna give us a welcome and tell us a little bit more about Orcas and her culture. We wanna welcome you to the Orcas exhibit performative is actually the Lepanga name for killer whale and paying respects to performative today is a very high honor to the Lepanga people as it's part of our origin story. Where I am today is actually at Songhees Point. It's a very important area to our people and we are the Lepanga people and this was our last stay before they moved us in 1911. And the word Lepungan actually means house of smoke herring. And as you can see, the waterway behind me is actually the herring ground of our people. Every First Nations has an origin story. The origin story of the Lepungan people is that there was four killer whales that swam in our waters. They swam in a circle so fast, and on off that circle came sea wolves. And when those sea wolves reached the land, they became wolves. From the wolves, they went to our national territory and became men of the land. That's who the Lepungan people are. And I just want to welcome you to the Orcas exhibit. Hi, Chikasia. So that was Florence Dick, and she said, hi, Chikasiam. That's how we could say thank you. We could, if you raise your hand and say, hi, Chikasiam, that's a way of saying thank you to Florence. And you heard her telling us about how her people their ancestors are the orcas who came ashore. Now, orcas and killer whales, those are the same thing. So sometimes I might say killer whales, sometimes I might say orcas, I mean the same animal. And we're gonna come around the corner here 
And one of the reasons that the Royal BC Museum wanted to do this exhibition about orcas is because we have orcas here off the coast of British Columbia. And there are different types of orcas that are here. There are three unique types. The first types are the transient orcas. And the transient orcas that we see in BC, they have really big ranges that go all over, but we will see they will be up here in the north and then around BC, we get these west coast transients. Transients are also known, known as bigs orcas and they are uh, unique, really big animals. We, we don't see them very, well, we do actually see them a little more often than some of the others. Um, and transients like to eat marine mammals. So sea lions, seals, that type of thing. Another type of orca that swim around here are offshore orcas. Now it's the offshore orcas we don't see very often. They're difficult to find and study. But one of the things scientists know about offshore orcas is that their favorite food are sharks. How do you know they like to eat sharks? Well, sharks have really rough skin. And by eating sharks, the, the teeth of offshore orcas have become very worn down. So when they have found these orcas with really worn down teeth, it started that study and they realized, ah, these are different types of orcas in a different habitat. But the orcas who are the real star of our exhibition are the orcas who spend the most time around uh, Vancouver Island, and those are the resident orcas. Resident orcas eat Chinook salmon. And there are three distinct pods here, the J pod, K pod, and the L pod. We're gonna turn around and we're gonna introduce you to the stars of our show, the J pod. So, up this first really big whale you see. These are life-size models that were made with 3D printers, really big 3D printers. And actually, I have, although I just said they're life-size, this first orca you see here, this is J1. His name is Ruffles. He is so big, they actually had to make him a little bit smaller to get him to fit in the gallery. And the biggest part is his dorsal fin up on the very top. And this is where, Ruffles gets his name. This fin has a curve in it, a bit wavy, like the Ruffles potato chip. And so the, sci um, the scientist named him J1. And the scientist was Michael Biggs. He was the first uh, scientist to, to figure out a system for identifying orcas. He realized they all had very distinct marks that could be used to identify them. And J1 was the first to be identified because he was so big and because his dorsal fin was so distinct, it was easy for researchers and whale watchers to spot him. So J1 Ruffles, he died in 2010. He was always seen in J-Pod swimming with Granny, who was the matriarch. Matriarchs are the female leaders of the orcas. Um, the female leader of J-Pod today is Slick. Slick is J16. Here's a model of Slick right here. After the other female leader, Granny, died, Granny was believed to be 100 years old, which is really quite amazing. Slick became the leader. So as the matriarch of this pod, she teaches them where to hunt. She teaches them when to hunt. She helps make all, teach, probably teaches the young, even some of the unique communication that they have. Now, Slick is a mom. She's had five babies, and this is one of her babies. This is Scarlet. Scarlet is known as J50, and Scarlet got her name because of the scars up by her dorsal fin. Do you see those gray lines that are near her dorsal fin? Those are caused because Scarlet was a difficult birth. And the scientists believe that when Scarlet was born, other orcas helped, helped her uh, be born. And with those marks were caused by the, their teeth gently helping to pull her out. So her name is Scarlet. So although we've got that big male in the front, he's not the leader. A very unique part of, of our resident orcas are they're, they're led by females and they stay in close family pods. So they'll stay, this J pod is a group of families. So that's, they're almost all related. They are almost usually all related and they stay very close together. 
there was a an exception. There's always an exception. <laughs> Later on, um, when they did some DNA research on Ruffles, they found out that he was not genetically related to Granny. It turns out Ruffles was from Lpod and somehow got adopted by Jpod. So there is always something new to learn about orcas. One thing that I think is really fascinating about orcas is that they live in a dark world. They are 95% of their time is spent under the water where it's dark and murky. So they have to have really good, in fact, fantastic hearing. And they have their own language. So J-Pod has its own language, K-Pod, L-Pod, they all have their own distinct languages. And I'm gonna see if you can recognize uh, orca call, or is it not an orca? So Dakota's going to show you the screen. We're going to listen to the sounds. And instead of standing on the check mark or the X that are here on the floor, I want you to type in the chat Y for yes, I think it's an orca, or N for no, I don't think it's an orca. Here's the first sound. Is that an orca? You have three seconds, Y or N. No, you're right. Did you guys guess kitten? Good job if you did. Okay, here's the next one. Get ready to vote again. Yes, Y or no, N. You got it, great. That was an orca. And what we're hearing there is some of their individual calls. Here we go, one more time, one more, last one. Ooh. Y or N? Lots of Ys. Yes, that was an orca. Pods share the same types of calls. We were saying how those family groups will have the same calls. Well, we're going to move on to another part of this exhibit, which is looking at the science of knowing orcas. Now, because hearing is so important that baby orcas, even when they're still developing and all their other bones and body parts are still fusing and growing, they have perfectly formed ears. That's how important listening or hearing is to orcas, that they're born with perfectly ready functioning ears. And they need these ears to communicate with one another, but they also need their ears for hunting and echolocation. Thanks Dakota for showing the ear bone. Now we're gonna show you a graph and talk a little bit about echolocation. Can you think of another animal? Have you heard of echolocation before? And if you have, can you think of another animal that echolocates? You can type it in the chat if you've heard of echolocation. Bats, Bats yes. So orcas also use echolocation, but it's slightly different for orcas. So we'll have a look here at the graph here of their head. Can we get this part in the, in the shot? We have to back up a little bit, there we go. And hopefully you can see the numbers. So to echolocate, orcas use sound, uh, create a sound by forcing air from the air sacs that are up there near their blowhole. So the air sacs are number two and the blowhole is number one. And so they're gonna force air from those air sacs through these phonic lips. Um, and that's gonna create these click sounds. And that sound then passes through some fatty tissue at the top of their head called the melon. And then that sound travels through the water and it finds something moving in the water. Now this sound is so amazing. Let's show them uh, the traveling of the sound being perfect. So it sees that there's a fish there. Now it doesn't just see that there's a fish there. That echolocation is so amazing. It is like an X-ray system. It can see what direction that fish is going to move, even when the fish is just thinking about it. How? I know, so it sounds like a superpower. It is really a superpower. The echolocation can see the fish swim bladder. The swim bladder is an uh, organ inside of the fish that adjusts for it to turn right or to turn left. The orca can see that, and it can see that this fish is going to turn right or left before it even does. I think that is just amazing. The sound clicks, those echolocations come back to the orca, they come into the jaw, they vibrate the jaw, which vibrates their ear bone, which sends the message to the brain. This is amazing. Like if we could see like, if we could see like that, and this is why orcas have never 
kill in the wild. Orcas have never in the wild killed a human being. You might have seen videos of people swimming beside orcas. And you know what? An orca can maybe click, send out some echolocation. They see, oh, wait, that's not a fish. I don't want that. That's not a sea lion. You could be dressed up like a sea lion. You could try making sea lion sounds. That orca is going to know because they can see, see inside you with this x-ray echolocation. Now, scientists also use sound to learn and to study about orcas. And we've got some of the tools that scientists use here. So how do you study an animal that spends 95% of its time underwater? Well, you've got to listen. And this is a hydrophone that could be put under the water to help scientists hear and listen for orcas. And those sounds tell them about orcas communication and their culture and uh, how they've grown and how they work as a group and as a society. Now to have that amazing ability and to be able to teach, to teach hunting, to teach language, orcas also have amazing brains. Now we humans, we like to think we're the smartest things on the planet. And we like to think we have the most complicated brains. There's a model of our brain. It's got lots of cordial folds and it's got these lobes where all different processing is happening. Look at the orca brain. <laughs> it's almost five times bigger than the human brain. It has all the same folds in it and it has an extra lobe just for echolocation. I think that's pretty amazing how big and beautiful that brain is. Now, we're going to be going behind the scenes in just a couple of minutes, but before we do, I want to show you some of the other whales because there are more than a dozen different um, types of whales around the world. Remember at the beginning in your poll, you were guessing which oceans are they in? Well, they are all over the oceans. They like the colder water more than the hot tropical zones, but in each of these areas, um, they're different, they are different orcas. Again, so remember, they'll have different communication and culture. And one of the ways that you can see their culture is through their hunting. So here's the offshore orcas. They like to hunt sharks, as I was mentioning. Neat thing, they only eat the shark's liver. And I thought, gee, that's a pretty small, that's pretty wasteful. But then I found out shark's livers can be about 30% of the size of the whole shark. So that's a pretty big, that's not a little bit of pate. That's like a big juicy steak. That's a lot of rich, nutritious food for them. Bigs or the transient orcas, they are the ones who hunt the sea mammals. So the sea lions and the seals. Here in this drawing, you can see that they use their tail to flap um, the seal into the air and the seal lands and it uh, makes it easier to eat the seal a little bit later. Our resident orcas, we were saying they love to eat Chinook salmon, in fact, that's all they really want to eat. And we haven't seen resident orcas in our waters until just recently, because they were off in other areas looking for their favorite food. Another really neat type, I think, is this one here. This is the pack type, pack ice type bee orca. And what they've learned to do is when seals try to hide from them, they jump up on the ice, the orcas will swim in a group to create a big wave and that knocks the seal off the ice and into the water where they can get them. There's so many neat ways that they eat. There's so much cool stuff to learn about orcas. But I'm gonna send you back to Chris and he's gonna show you a video while Dakota and I go behind the scenes to show you a few more things. We'll see you soon. Kim, before you go, can I ask uh, one question? Yes, you may. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, so there was a little <laughs> bit of debate in the chat um, are orcas dolphins? Okay, that's a tricky question. So they are a part of the same family. I think it's Ascendente. So they are the largest member of the dolphin family, but uh, they are also such a, a unique animal and species. Uh, people have called them whales. So yes, they can be uh, considered part of the dolphin family. Great. Thank you. Um, and yeah, so you're you're going to go to a whole nother building. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to turn your video off just for now, um, and then we'll see you in about 10 minutes. But join in whenever you're when whenever you're there. Um, so um, so 
we what we're going to do now is um, in the exhibition. So you saw the first two galleries of the exhibition, and there are three, at least three or four more galleries. So when you do come to Victoria, um, hopefully you'll be able to see the exhibition if you haven't already. Um, and one of the galleries that is also really important um, part of the exhibition throughout the exhibition is the the um, uh, honoring indigenous knowledge and traditional eco ecological knowledge around orcas, um, deep rich history. And um, so indigenous knowledge is a really a central part of the, the exhibition. Um, so what I wanted to do is show a, a video and it's only about two or three minutes, but it's of master carver Richard Hunt. Um, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's a really lovely video and it's a, about him carving an uh, a, a orca uh, mask that's in the exhibition that you would see in the exhibition. So um, what I'm gonna do right now is uh, go to that. So I'm just... I'm going to just make sure that I... Um, hold on just a second. Uh, okay, so thank you for your patience. Um, I'm gonna set that up now. All right. My name is Richard Hunt. My native name is Guila Yukulagulis, and it means a man that travels wherever he goes, he potlatches. We always use cedar because cedar's got its own wood preservative in it. If the guy that taught me was my father. Go style. But who knows what Kwagyo style is? I mean, our people change so much. His style is evolving. It's evolving. Gave me and um, advance it and try to make it a little bit better. In the Orca mask, my uncle Tommy asked me if I could make it for him. My chief to build him up was uh, an honor. When our chiefs die, the whales come to their harbor to uh, take their souls. So we consider the killer whales the spirits of our great chiefs. The New York mask is used in a dance in a class law or peace dance where people will leave and come back transformed from a human to a whale. The bottom jaw of the killer whale has a string that makes the bottom jaw open and close. Then there's a handle that'll make the dorsal fin go up and then at the same time the tail goes up. So he looks like he's kind of swimming. Guy de adds it to texture it so the ripple, like the light hits it, and painted it with high gloss enamel because, you know, a killer whale's wet. It's ours, it comes from our culture. We never stopped dancing, we never stopped our traditions. We're still alive, we're still carrying on, we're getting stronger. Everything's coming back. So, um, and I see that, so thanks everyone for, for watching that. And 65 years ago, with oh. the number of vehicle registrations on. The video uh, continued as YouTube does. So, um, so we are, so we traveled from the exhibition space to behind the scenes of the Collections Tower. The Collections Tower is uh, 14 floors high and um, each floor is filled with uh, different objects and specimens and belongings. Um, 
And Kim, what, what floor are you on uh, now? Dakota and I are on the fourth floor of the museum and we're standing just outside of the mammalogy collection area. So if you remember from the poll we did at the beginning, orcas are mammals. So that means they breathe air, uh, they give birth to live young, they usually have some kind of hair on their bodies and they have uh, the mothers feed the babies with milk. So this is an area of the, of the museum that's all about uh, mammals and mammals in BC. Did you know that BC has more, has the largest diversity of mammals in, than any other province in Canada? I think that's pretty awesome. So we have more different types of mammals here than any other province does. But we only have one mammal that is unique to British Columbia. Do you want to make a guess and type in the chat what animal do you, mammal, do you think is only found in BC? Some of you joining from BC, you might know this one. Might be a little harder for others. We have uh, orca, we have kermode bear, we have mountain. Kermode bears are our provincial mammals. And we do have a, an example of one here. And in fact, kermode, that name was given because of, that was the name of one of the curators here at the, at the museum, it was the provincial museum of BC at the time. And Kim, we have, named after him. we have a request to just uh, rephrase the question. Okay, what is the only mammal? It's a mammal in BC and it's only found in BC. It's not found anywhere else. It is endangered. In fact, I'll, I'll narrow it down. It only lives on Vancouver Island and Vancouver is in its name. Is it small and cute? It is small, it is cute. If you watch hockey, I think it is the mascot for the Vancouver Royals or Vancouver Island Royals, Victoria, Roy Victoria Royals. <laughs> you got, we have Marmot. Yes, the Vancouver Island Marmot is a, the only unique animal to BC. But uh, we have examples in the Royal BC Museum of almost every type of mammal found here. And for example, I want to, we're going to start just showing you some of the ways that the uh, pieces in the museum are collected and stored. So these are all, maybe you can tell by looking at them. Again, you can put in the chat if you know what kind of animal the skull is from. Give you a hint here with the Latin name. <laughs> Got a guess of a bull or a goat. Ooh, okay, it does have horns. Um, this is horn a big, sheep. big horn sheep, yes. And why would we have so many? Why do you think that we need so many? Why don't, if we just have one, why isn't that enough? Let's take a closer look and see if we can get some ideas. I'm looking like here at how oh, wide that one is. Oh, that one's quite a bit different. And the color is different. And, yeah, even the size of the jaws is bigger and different. Yeah, so we have so many different types because there are so many different variations and things. And having a collection in a museum, it's like the next best thing to having a time machine. So if you were a study, uh, if you were a researcher or a scientist studying bighorn sheep and you were wondering, thinking to yourself, have bighorn sheep gotten bigger or how, are they getting smaller? Are they, um, are they eating more grass? Or are they eating more something else? You can't get into a time machine and go back in time and look at bighorn sheep and study that question, but you can come to a museum. And in a museum, you can see examples of, of bighorn sheep or the animal or, that you are studying. And you will see examples of it from th across time, but also from across place. So these tags would tell us a few of those things. This one, uh, we're learning from that symbol that it's a male. We learned that it was this specimen was collected in the winter of 1967, 68. By who? This is the name of the, I imagine, a, sign, a museum worker who, who made this collection. And from where? 
So you could find all the specimens from this area. Maybe you'd find more from different time periods and then you could start to look and compare and you'd start to notice trends and how things are moving and changing and developing. Now, unlike in our exhibits where you see uh, mammals that have been taxidermied, a little bit like this one over here, here's an, an example of taxidermy where an animal has been uh, preserved with its fur and it's kept in a kind of shape. Um, this is a really big specimen and we can't keep a bunch of really big specimens. We just don't have the room. So quite often only it's only parts of the animals that are kept and collected. And with something like an orca or a killer whale, they are kept separately or sometimes only just certain parts are kept. So here we have some of the collection of our orcas that we have here at the museum. And you can see that this area is almost all skulls. So if we have a look down here, let's take a look at this one because it's closest to us. It's also uh, a, a, the most different color. This is uh, from Quadra Island and it was collected in 1949 by Clifford Carl, who was also the director of the museum. And Wow, this, this one looks like it was in pretty rough shape. I don't know exactly why the color is so different, but you'll notice here are gaps. What do you think used to be in these gaps? If this is the skull of the orca. Teeth, yeah, great everybody. So the teeth, they don't stay in place. They do come out, they fall out. So they're actually kept separately as well. And here we can see uh, the teeth have been taken out. Uh, well, they fell out, but they were kept and collected together. So we know this is from T12. And then each tooth is also numbered with that number and the number of positions. So it's like um, if you were to take apart a puzzle after you made it and you wanted to, rec you wanted to record all those pieces so you could put it back together exactly right, you might name them all and number them all to help you put that puzzle back together. I wanna to show you another part. So over here we have um, some of the vertebrae. These are the parts of your spine. And there's two different ones here. We'll show you this one first. I want you to look at this vertebrae. And then we're gonna look just over here, uh, up here rather, at this one, so it is smaller, but do you notice any other differences between those two different vertebrae, spinal columns that we're looking at? Let's slow down on this one a little bit. What do you notice about it? Well, the phone just went flop for no reason. <laughs> okay, it's back. So if we look at this one, pretty smooth, like if I, were, I'm not going to touch it, but if I were to run my finger along that, it's got a few little bumps in it. But when I get to this one, look at all the bumps that it has. It actually has, they're kind of unusual looking. And when I look up at this other one to compare it, it doesn't have any bumps like that. So this, um, these vertebrae from this uh, spinal cord, they're showing us that this orca actually had something like arthritis. So it's documenting um, what that would look like on the species. Imagine they would have had a stiff or sore back as they were trying to move around. So by having different, um, a large collection with many different specimens in it, you can start to see um, different um, the ways animals have changed, what, what they look like when they aren't well, what they look like when they're young, what they look like when they're older. So it gives you a really big picture throughout time and space. And there was no massage therapist in sight. Right? Not a one, no. <laughs> so Tim, we have a question, we have a question okay. about do the specimens have names? Mm. You know, I don't see names here. I see very uh, scientific labels. Here's another one to look at. There's our Orsinus orca, which we know means demon. What was it, Chris? Demon of? Demons of the deep. Demons of the deep or demon, yeah, demon whale, demon killer, demon, demon whale, killer whale. Just a number here, a sign that it was a male, where it's from, alert bay, comma, Cormorant Island. So um, 
1973. So they're not named like that. They would only be kept with that number 8386. And 8386 would be written on each one of those vertebrae to help keep track of them. Any other questions? We did have I'm a open. Mm -hmm. We did have a question um, from Sasha on Facebook Live. I uh, just okay. asked, how is climate change affecting orcas? What a great question. I'd like to, I, I bet you there are, uh, oh, our phone again is doing funny things. Um, I bet you there are scientists who are studying that. I wonder what, what, do, what do you all think climate change might be doing? How it might it be affecting orcas, do you think? If the water is heating up? Remember, our orcas like cold water. I bet you if the water warms up, they might have to find different territory that might have to move. Uh, if the water keeps warming up, the fish and prey that lived there might move, and that would make the orcas have to move. Yeah, that was That's... one of the answers on, on Zoom chat, uh, oh, okay. is killing their food. And yeah. then Megan then said to need to find new food sources. That's right. And that's something scientists don't really know yet. So remember it's saying how uh, residents are led by matriarchs, these female leaders who teach them. And when a, a new matriarch comes along, what they're curious about is, will she teach them new things? Or will she only te teach them what she is taught? So some people have wondered, if Chinook salmon are getting harder and harder to get, why don't the resident orcas just eat something else? Why don't they switch? Why don't they go to another type of fish? So that's something that researchers and scientists are watching. They're wondering, hmm, so Slick is fairly new as a leader. Will she start to, will, will they start trying to something different? Will they do something different? Or will they never leave and stop looking for just Chinook? So that is, that's a great scientific question. That's some kind of, that's research you could do. And we have another question that's actually related to another part of the exhibition that we didn't get to. Um, but a really good question. Are orcas still taken from the wild for amusement parks? Mm, so in some places they are still. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I know in Canada, we are no longer capturing orcas and haven't been since uh, I believe the seventies and many other places as well. I, I'm hesitant to say in case I get it wrong. So maybe you can look it up, Chris, but I believe they are still capturing them in um, Russia and possibly in Japan. And orcas are still, or orcas are even on the menu in some places. In Norway, people uh, eat orca. You can find it in a restaurant. So there are different um, relationships and attitudes about orcas in different parts of the world. But in Canada, we are no longer capturing them. And in fact, um, aquariums are no longer allowed to have an orca in captivity unless they currently have one and it was born there then they can keep it, but they can't add any new orcas uh, to aquariums anymore. So I think that's a good thing. We were getting a few sad emojis and it, it is sad, that, mm -hmm. but, but hopefully even other places that are still doing that will um, start to change, uh, public opinion will start to change. I, you know, I think it will because that's what's happened for us here in British Columbia. So. Um, it was in the 1960s that the first orca was captured. It was captured, captured accidentally. Its name was, Mo they named it Moby Doll. Uh, they were actually trying to kill it to make a model um, for the Vancouver Aquarium and they missed. And instead they captured this orca and they brought it back to Vancouver. And in the short time that it lived in Vancouver Harbor, I think it was less than a month, um, people went from being terrified of these killer whales to falling in love with them and wanting to know more about them and to learn from them. And a lot of our scientists today, like uh, who study and uh, studied about them have learned uh, from them first in aquariums or by observing them in aquariums. And all of that education about them has helped uh, grow the movement. So some of those kids who went to aquarium shows in the seventies, they became uh, activists and even uh, organizations like Greenpeace started here in BC. And I just got a comment just saying that hopefully if they do have, if, if those parks do have orcas that at least the tanks are larger so that they could. Um, yeah. Yeah, orcas, they can swim 30 kilometers an hour. They can dive incredibly deep. 
and imagine they're going from being in the ocean to a very small environment. Uh, so it's unhealthy for them, both physically and mentally, to be in an environment like that. So Kim, you're going to show us what's in that. Yeah, I was going to show you another, um, uh, just a couple more examples of the types of things we have here. This drawer, it smells. I wish you could be here. I wish you could smell it because you open it up and there's a definitely an aroma that's here. But here's an example. Remember I was mentioning how this- Describe the aroma. Um, Dakota, how would you describe this aroma? It's kind of hard to describe. It's like kind of, I want to say musty, but- mm. It's a little bit. It's a unique smell. <laughs> a little bit to me like vinegar and mold. <laughs> but not, it's not moldy. So I, I'm not sure exactly what. But remember we were saying that the teeth um, come out. So they yeah, they do there's an orca too. And it fits very loosely in there. And some of these have already gone missing. But um, I think I like the way that they've been stored here separately in a bag and all numbered so that you can't lose any of them. We were also showing you that orca ear bone that was in the um, exhibit upstairs. And here's a one, a much larger one from a larger uh, whale. There's some of the information about that eardrum. Ah, but this is not from an orca. This is from a thin brack whale. Interesting. Put that back in there too. Yeah, so Lots of neat things. Oh, I think this is pretty cool. I can't open the door because there's something in front. Can you show, um, can you see this part of an orca fin? Or sorry, this is a porpoise fin, a dolphin fin. But that's a fin. But look at the structure there. It's a lot like a hand. So each part under, oh, the phone just flips. Um, it has like a flanges and little knuckles and things. So if I were a dolphin, I'd still have kind of like my fingers, they'd just all be webbed together to make a fin. Next time, now, you, there are... next time you're swimming, Kim, you can, you can think about <laughs> I will. Come on this way too. Let's go over here. Just a quick question as you're walking. Can orchids be put back in the wild after being captive? Um, you know, there are um, some areas that are trying that right now in Australia. There is a protected area. So it's a much, much, it does have like a, not quite a net around it, but it does have a, I guess it is like a net around it. Um, and it is a place where orcas who have been in captivity can go because they aren't necessarily going to know the language <laughs> anymore of those other orcas who are there. They'll have different habits and things and they'll get rehabilitated in an area like that before they are released. And in Canada, I believe it's Alexandra Morton is working on opening a marine protected area as well. That would be for orcas who had been in captivity. I think it's pretty complicated. You have to move the orca. All oh, that would be quite stressful. Imagine trying to move an animal that lives in the water most of the time, putting it on an airplane or a boat or, or however it would need to be moved. It'd be pretty difficult. We have some other, I want to show you this since we're talking about orcas, not orcas, but about whales. Anybody know what that would be? It's not from an orca, but it is from another kind of whale. Oh, somebody said a, a piece of skin. It's not skin. Someone did, uh, when, someone did say baleen. Somebody said baleen. Great. So baleen is found in the jaw. And orcas have teeth. So they're meat eaters. They've got their teeth to eat meat. And baleen is instead of teeth. And it's used like a filter. This is almost like, think of the long... Um, if you had a comb with really long ends on it and you could swish it through the water and little things to eat like krill would get caught in there and you could filter them into your mouth, swoosh out all the water and have a nice yummy meal of krill. So that's baleen, a little piece of baleen we have. Oh, Chris, you showed me something neat up here that uh, people might like to see as well. Speaking of marine mammals, let's put this, up here, yeah. You might recognize this. 
Walrus, yes, look at those tusks. They're very distinctive, aren't they? Yeah, so that's a male walrus. That's the only information I can see from here. It says education collection. So sometimes um, in the an education collection item like this, this is something that I can touch. It's something I could take into the gallery and show people or into a classroom and we could use it. And it lacks information. So we don't know where it was collected or when or by who. So for a researcher or somebody studying, it's not as useful for them. But for the other items in the collection, those are really important for researchers. So the, although they're sitting up here in the collection area, these are used and accessed by researchers, not just in BC, but all around the world. So a collection can be really quite active and it can be used. And as I was saying earlier, it can be used by scientists who are studying a project or even by lawmakers who want to make policies about protecting whales and orcas and making protected marine areas for them. So they can be put to a lot of use for many different purposes. Speaking of protecting, Kim, we're, we just have a few minutes uh, left, but uh, one question that came in was, uh, do, do orcas attack people in the wild? Um, no, yeah. next question, never. <laughs> it's never been documented <laughs> of orcas killing anyone in the wild. And, um, and but speaking of that is uh, we I think everyone here, especially like keener kids who want to protect nature and and love nature, um, are there things that that we could do to help protect the habitat and protect the environment uh, for orcas to mm -hmm. have their their environment be like a safer and healthier place. That is a great question. And I hope everybody in the chat, you know what, you can type in your answers as well. I'm gonna name just a couple of things I can think of. So orcas live in the ocean and that's their habitat, but our habits impact them. So when we throw away or flush away things like that could be recycled, and I'm thinking particularly about plastic pollution, there's a lot of plastic pollution in the ocean. And although orcas are super smart and they can see what they're eating, they sometimes accidentally, when they'll take that, that big gulp of water while they're grabbing onto that salmon, if there's plastic floating in the water, um, that could be anything from a shopping bag to tiny little microplastics called nurdles that are used to make plastic uh, that get washed into the water and the rain systems and then travel throughout the oceans those things can accumulate inside of an orca and or any marine mammal or even a bird. And as, as if they eat those plastics, they don't, they can't, they never break down or digest. So they just sort of fill up and make your stomach feel full. And then an orca could, or this marine mammal or bird end up starving or dying from something like that. So definitely thinking about recycling and pollution and what we put, what we're putting into the water, that's a big one. Were there some other ideas in the chat, Chris? Yeah, we have um, a great idea of like making boats more silent or silent. That's wonderful, yeah, yeah. And in fact, there are uh, marine protected areas and regulations in British Columbia about no-go areas for big shipping containers and um, other boats so that it's we're not competing with orcas and the echolocation that they need to do to hunt. Um, Becca and Sasha say that they're doing a, a fundraiser for orcas. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Um, Zahara says uh, stop fishing or maybe like be like maybe be more mindful in terms of fishing. Yes, that's great. And in fact, um, some of the studies and research about orcas does uh, affect policies about when people can, and commercial fishers too, when they can uh, fish salmon and when they need to stop fishing salmon. Mm -hmm. And then also uh, that boats catch can, can accidentally catch orcas and other animals. So have maybe having regulations about that. Mm -hmm. we have great ideas, everybody. Yeah, we have two two more questions, and maybe we'll end with those. Um, okay. One question is, how long do orca babies stay with their moms? Mm, well, it depends on the pods, but let's say for J pods, because those are when, or for resident orcas, um, and J pod in particular, they'll stay with their moms forever. 
So they'll just stay with their parents the whole time. Mm. Yeah. And then and the uh, family units are, yeah, the family units are very, very close. And then uh, last question, do orcas eat great white sharks? And will they eat a shark even if the shark didn't do anything? <laughs> even if it's just a sweet little innocent shark minding its own business, if that shark is swimming, say, in South Africa and the resident and the orcas in South Africa spot it, yes, they have been known to um, snack on great white sharks too. If if it's like that question about uh, if you were to put uh, I don't name two superheroes and have them fight. If <laughs> orcas always always bet on the orca, they are super smart. They're um, they're usually working with others in their family or in their group, and they've got their own unique strategies, and they're passing down that knowledge to the next generations who are then adapting it and improving it. You cannot beat an orca <laughs> if an orca has decided you are lunch, even if you're a great white shark. So they might not have a cape, but they are definitely a superhero. They've got uh, some superpowers, yes. Yeah, totally. So I'm going to put my camera back on and um, Megan and Rebecca, definitely um, feel free to put yours on as well. Um, actually, there was one more question that I just think is a nice one to end on, because I think we probably, everyone in this Zoom call and this Facebook Live would say that we love orcas. Um, do orcas love humans? And what do you think? Oh, golly, you know, I think so. <laughs> There are some, some really touching stories uh, between whale watchers for, with indigenous peoples, um, even with researchers. Uh, so one of these uh, researchers, and I'm, I'm forgotten their name, but a really pioneering researcher, um, he died and there was a, a funeral for him. They went out in a boat and um, they were going to spread his ashes when a super pod of orcas showed up. So that's when J, K, and L all get together. They all came up, they showed up for this event. Um, there's the wonderful story of Lunard Success, um, who was up at, was it Alert Bay? Yeah, who uh, is believed to have been an ancestor of a chief who, who died and came, the, and Luna came back to be with people and played with people and dogs and kids and boats. I really seem to love to be there. Yeah. I like to think they love us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Kim. And thanks, Dakota, for your uh, great camera work, even though the camera fell down a couple of times. It had its own ideas. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Rebecca and Megan, thank you so much for um, thanks for joining today and um, to all the nature kids out there and maybe nature kids to be. Um, uh, thank you so much for joining in. Rebecca and Megan, any last any last words? Anything you particularly were wowed by or, or found an interesting tidbit? Oh, I just loved learning the science behind the creatures that we sometimes catch a glimpse of when we're on the water on the Georgia Strait and BC ferries. Just a few weeks ago, I saw some dancing. And, you know, thank you to to Dakota and to Kim and, and to you, Chris, for hosting. Um, we have a, a website that people can subscribe to, you know, newsletters and different ways of connecting with us and, and um, get a chance to see and participate in more events like this, naturekidsbc.ca. Great, I will put that in the chat. Naturekidsbc.ca. Uh, you bet. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, Megan, any last, any last words? Um, just thank you so much for being able to do this, and Kim and Dakota for your, you know, walking everybody through it. Um, it was an awesome hour, well spent. Oh, okay. Kim, are you are you saying something? I forgot to mute. Oh, oh there's. <laughs> she should put her out so everyone can see her too. Thanks, Dakota. Say goodbye. All right. Hello. Thanks, Dakota. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, everyone. Um, and uh, until next time. Have a great night. Have a great night, everyone. Bye. Yeah.